two NHL teams are facing a very uncertain future. It's Thursday, May 18th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The Arizona Coyotes put their future up to a vote, and on Tuesday night, the voters of Tempe rejected their proposal for a new arena and surrounding development. Prior to the vote, we had Coyotes president and CEO Javier Gutierrez on, and I asked him what plan B was if the vote fails, and he said plan B was winning. Basically, there was no plan B. Now they need to think of a plan C. Here to help us figure out this team's future is our senior reporter, AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, is there any chance this team stays in Arizona? Yeah, there's a little wild card here. I think the, the most likely route, and uh, Sarver, the former owner of the Suns, was kind of very against the Coyotes uh, playing it at Footprint Center. Um, now I've had messages out for Matt Ishiba, who took over in February, uh, officially took over for, over for Sarver as the managing owner. Now they're and um, asking around. Really, to, that's probably the most likely route because I, you know, even though there's a two or more years left on the lease at ASU for the 5,000 seat you know, Mullet Arena, which is a temporary solution. And they've done upgrades there. It's just not going to work. And the NHL owners do not want them to be playing there any longer than they have to without looking, you know, if you're looking, if you play two more seasons there and you have a new arena, you know, awesome brand new arena. Yeah, that's one thing. But if there's no, there, there is no path forward and there's Mesa, there's Indian, um, you know, Indian reservation land you could use, you know, that it's, but it's not, it's not optimal. And you're going to start the process all over again. So the most likely route from those I've talked to so far is relocation. But like you said, there's been really no, the NHL has been quiet. Javier didn't say much last night, didn't take any questions after the vote. Um, uh, you know, the unofficial results were um, uh, put forward. So it's it, it's really anybody's guess. And, uh, you know, the cities uh, that uh, we can get into the cities that most likely will uh, could be the next home for the Coyotes. But at this point, there's I think there's still a little sense of shock that it was it wasn't even close. None of the three propositions garnered more than 44 percent so it's kind of it's just like they were they were like you said they were counting on this uh, these three props to pass yeah and i think you know obviously i don't know all the factors that would go into uh whether they could play at the sun's arena but ishbia does want to ingratiate himself with this community so this would be a, a nice way to do it um we'll see there But yeah, there are other cities that would be happy to have an NHL team. So who should we be looking at there? According to my mentions, Houston's the only place. Uh, (laughs) I know. Uh, um, Houston's one of them. Uh, Quebec City. uh, Yeah, I've been seeing that that chatter. Yeah, uh, Salt Lake City uh, seems like to be in the running. I think they have a little bit of an, I might say an edge, but it's interesting because, you know, the, the Jazz want a new arena. You know, they it'll be you know, very near where they're at now. Um, and, you know, the current arena is not great for hockey. It could be like a Barclay situation where, you know, you have to do some uh, kind of reconfiguration, cut down the seating and such. But, you know, you're looking at you know, a path forward to a new arena a multi, you know, for hockey and for, for basketball uh, there in Salt Lake. And it's, it's a, you know, there's a little bit of a natural rival, rivalry with the uh, – with the abs already, if they, if they move there. Um, so, but yeah, but there's uh, Portland's been mentioned. Memphis has been mentioned, uh, even Atlanta. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It'd be another go around for Atlanta. Yeah. Salt Lake is kind of this interesting, you know, they want an MLB team now, obviously they already have the jazz, you know, they're, they're trying to make, make moves to the sports world and you know, why not? Um, so yeah, we'll obviously we be tracking this one pretty closely, but yeah, it's difficult times right now for, for that franchise. Let's hop up over to the Ottawa Senators, who are probably staying in Ottawa, but they will be doing so under new ownership. Uh, what's the status of the sale of that team? Yeah, I just, uh, just heard, and I put it on Twitter, that uh, there's not going to be a decision until un- until next week. There's four groups who that, su- that have submitted uh, final binding bids out of, there were, there, were, there were seven to start. There were seven in the process to the, to the almost to the very end. Ryan Reynolds' group uh, kind of backed out of several days ago. Um, and, uh, Vivek who owns the, uh, the Kings, uh, did not submit a bid. So there, um, and so there's, it's really kind of anyone's game at this point. There's a lot of, it's hard for me to tell which ones, uh, are the most, uh, you know, are the, you know, are, are the best bids at this point. Um, you know, the, the, the sports banking firm GSP is handling this and, uh, been very quiet. Uh, so, but there, yeah, the, um, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a decision next week. And, uh, you know, I think the next, they're probably probably by this weekend they'll internally have you know who they want 
and uh, looks like uh, the daughters of the of, of the former owner um, or the current owner. Oh. He passed away uh, that, you know, they it's been reported that they're going to keep 10 percent, which makes it very interesting. So they're going to be not only do they want to pass off the team to somebody who is going to you know move it forward. They're going to be you know, along for the ride, possibly so that that could take uh, that could take uh, I mean, maybe a little more a little more time because they want to make sure they're more comfortable since they uh, since they're going to be you know, possibly part of the group um, once it's uh, all said and done. And is there any chance that team leaves Ottawa? Once they have no, the ownership, no, no, it, it's really a word to mean where they're their arena is not, it's not great, but it's not that bad. I, I covered the 2007 finals there. It's, it is like several, about 15 miles away from downtown Ottawa. They do want to have to get down to the flats in Ottawa or, or a couple other spots near downtown. Um, so there, you know, there's, it's not the worst arena in, 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 you know, ever it's not like they're playing at you know the cow palace like the sharks did when i was a kid so there's a so there's really not you know there's really no rush but they do you know that there's debt there's everything else the team has you know either been profitable or not profitable going back and forth for so many years uh that they i think they need a new arena to uh move forward so that's uh so that's going to be uh down the road and that's going to be part of the plan and that's probably going to be part of the vetting process here it's like oh not only do you need the money the one billion dollars or so it's going to take you're going to need to um you know foot the bill for a uh, or at least a large chunk of it and we don't know how much public money is going to be coming into it uh for a new arena yeah absolutely all right very interesting stuff aj perez thanks so much for joining us thanks for having me up next, I spoke to Donald De La Haye, who was a college football player a few years before the Supreme Court ruled that the NCAA has to allow players to profit off their name, image, and likeness. While he was playing, he also had a YouTube channel that was becoming popular enough to start monetizing it. And once that happened, the NCAA told him he can play college football or he can make money on YouTube, but he can't do both. His story from that point forward is fascinating and full of ups and downs. We'll have my conversation with Donald De La Haye right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash frontoffice. That's netsuite.com slash front office. I'm very excited to be joined by Donald De La Haye, founder of the platform Destroying. Welcome, Donald. Thank you, man. Appreciate you having me, man. I'm super excited. Super excited to be here. Yeah. So you've got a pretty interesting story about how you ended up where you are today. Mm -hmm. So... Um, basically you were a, a college football player who was also making videos on the side and you ran into some issues with the NCAA around that. So let's start there. What, what problems was the NCAA having with you at that time? Man. So at the time, NIO wasn't a thing. We know the, the golden rule nowadays, college athletes can make money off their name, image, and likeness. But back then there was no such thing. Um, so I started creating content on YouTube while I was a college football kicker. And uh, my content started blowing up to the point where I could monetize my channel. And then once I monetized it, you know, I thought I was doing OK. And then our compliance officer at our university hit me up and said, hey, uh, if you're monetizing your videos, we're going to have an issue. So basically, after a few weeks, maybe a month and a half or two months or so of investigating my channel, all the posts I did, the money I was making and things like that, which wasn't a lot, by the way, they basically told me I have an ultimatum. I either have to pick my YouTube channel and forfeit my eligibility, or I pick my scholarship, donate all the money back that I made, delete my social media and continue playing. So, I mean, fast forward six years later, um, my channel is doing pretty well. So you could kind of tell what I picked. Yeah. Yeah. So you could have been making like $10 a week and they still would have said, you know, if you're making any amount of money, yeah, um, yeah, you yeah. can't be doing this. Yeah. Yeah. At the time it, it wasn't a, a ton of money. I mean, for a college athlete, it was a lot back then, but I probably made like two, three grand that summer. 
Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What went into that decision? Because, you know, I'm sure your aspirations might have been toward like the NFL as a as an athlete. Um, that's a lot to give up. So why did you pick being a creator? So, yeah, my aspirations were definitely to play professional football. But I also had this passion that I grew up just being in love with. I love creating content. I love being creative. It was kind of like my outlet. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but college sports are a very tough thing to be a part of. So on the side, I'd make my videos and kind of just enjoy myself. And eventually when this came up, my decision making process was, I ain't gonna lie, I did a lot of crying, I'll admit. Uh, talked to a lot of friends, family, loved ones, just asked for advice all around. And uh, I think what I ended up doing was just going with my gut, with my heart and what I thought I had the most potential with. I felt like with my channel getting so much traction and success at the time was kind of like catching lightning in a bottle. And I felt like there was other avenues to go as far as playing professional football. So felt like I had to take advantage of what was going on in my life at the time and pick my content. Yeah. And let's get into the the content itself. So I, I've watched a bit of it and it, it's like it's like football content where it's mostly uh, football. Um, it's sports focused, um, but it's kind of got this like, I don't know, like community vibe to it. It's not like you're seeing NFL stars, but you're seeing very good athletes playing football. Why do you think this resonates? Um, I think it resonates to people because one, I've been blessed enough to have such a large platform. And then I put people on this platform and, and help them create opportunities. Like guys get looked at and recruited and scouted. But back then I wasn't doing any of this stuff. I was just kind of documenting my life, documenting my day to day, you know, skateboarding the class, uh, going to the indoor facility training, working on my kicking, just kind of taking people through my journey as a college athlete. Now, obviously I'm not in the same position anymore. So I don't make that same type of content anymore, but now it's more focused on the community, how I can help them, how I could give them opportunities, help people see that there's a lot of talent out there that goes unnoticed. Obviously, you, you know, you committed early to, to this path, but was there a moment along that path where you said like, okay, this is really happening. Like I don't have to stop what I'm doing and becoming an, become an accountant or something. Um, was there like a moment where it's like, okay, this is real. Uh, I think that moment was when I picked my uh, my YouTube channel over my scholarship, because at that point there was no turning back. There was no, oh, man, I take it back. Can I go back and play like nah, I made the decision? I was deemed ineligible and I had to you know, grow up, be a man and figure things out. Uh, I actually, fun fact, I was actually homeless for about six months, slept on my best friend's couch. He had a little one bedroom apartment with his girlfriend, and his dog, and I was just kicking it on the couch. And basically every day I woke up and. I told myself, look, I I can't fail. Like I have no other option. So every day I got up, you know, low key got some crying in and then just went straight to work. Put in a lot of hours editing, filming, uh, a lot of hours into the creative and just continued to make the content. I imagine that would be, I mean, obviously a like, tough for a lot of reasons, but also like you've got the this like very sort of like human social reason of like you are depending on someone you're leaning on on your friend and his partner um just to give you housing and that's a tough situation just because like if there's no end point you know when that's necessarily going to change where you're going to be able to move out when they don't know when that is that you know maybe they're just cool with that or maybe uh, there gets to be a point where it's like okay like is, is donald going to be here forever <laughs> yeah so to be honest my best friend like he's he's a key uh key person in my journey because he also helped me with content we did a lot of videos together so he actually quit his job and like obviously it wasn't to the same scale as m me leaving my uh, scholarship but he also quit his job and he decided he's like we're, we're gonna do this we're gonna work together we're gonna work hard and we're, we're not gonna fail at this so it was even a point where he got his car repossessed like we didn't have money to pay the rent type of thing so like we knew we had to just put our head down and work and things started looking good after about six months or so we we're confident that this wasn't just dying off. Like it just kept going. The trajectory was upward. So we we're like, all right, we, we could probably move into an apartment now and I could have my own space and so forth. So, yeah. yeah. Was anyone trying to talk you out of it and just like, you know, get a regular job and, you know, maybe this will happen later, but, you know, you need to pay the rent. <laughs> it was or like to be honest, there was a lot of haters and doubters when I was going through my decision making process because it was something that was public when the news first came out that I was possibly facing ineligibility. Uh, a lot of news outlets and stuff picked it up. So there was a lot of people hating. There was a lot of people saying this guy's stupid. This guy's dumb. Why would you? 
give away, you know, a forty thousand dollar scholarship a year for a stupid little YouTube channel and this and that. And uh, a lot of people doubt, a lot of people hate it, but you know, that's usually when the sweetest victories come is when people is hating on you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nice when you can prove them wrong. Um, so now NIL is a thing. Um, if you know, if if your life had started a, a few years later, you probably wouldn't have had to make all these decisions. Um, how does that feel knowing that things are better for the athletes of today, but that you didn't have that chance? You know, it's amazing, to be honest. And a lot of people ask me, oh, you're probably so upset that, you know, NIL ain't a thing no more. But, man, I, I couldn't be any happier that my student athlete brothers and sisters get to reap the opportunities and get to make money and get to provide for themselves and their families at this point. Because um, for a long time, the NCAA was profiting billions and billions and athletes weren't seeing a single penny. So I'm happy that they're able to do that. If anything, I love that it happened because now I get to give out advice. I kind of was like the poster child for it. I kind of went through that and, and have experienced things. So now I get to give advice and help steer people in the right direction and, you know, help them get paid, man. Getting back to the content you produce. So you're primarily on YouTube. How do you tailor your content for the platform? Uh, so my content is very unique, to be honest. I know YouTube and big popular YouTubers have this specific formula they use, like, you know, the Mr. Beast of the world. There's a lot of people that kind of copy his formula, but I kind of know what my audience likes. I kind of know what they enjoy. Uh, as long as the video is entertaining and as long as, you know, I could sit there and watch it and love it, then I, I know the audience will love it too. What is it that that makes it click for you for and for your audience? When do you know it's going to be good? Whether it's a story um, or just the action, I think in the football community, obviously, I don't know if you watch sports or not, but you watch football games. You kind of know when it's a good game. You kind of know when things are exciting, when there's a lot of risk and things like that. But uh, within the videos, I kind of know once we're filming, it's like, all right, this 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 is going to be dope. This is going to be a banger. They're going to love this one. So, you know, I, I owe a lot to my team. I have an amazing team and my guys work very hard on editing the videos. I've scaled up a little bit and I don't spend my time editing anymore, but they do an amazing job, man. They kill it every time. And did the growth you've got over 5 million subscribers now, um, did that growth just happen from people finding you and maybe the algorithm recommends, maybe they recommend it? Did it all just happen organically? I think, yeah, definitely organically. I think the consistency has been a big thing. I'm always trying to innovate and be bigger and better and do cooler, more fun things that the audience is going to enjoy. I feel like if you do the same thing over and over and over again, like that's the definition of insanity, expecting things to grow and expecting different results. But Usually when I start to feel things kind of getting a little stale or a little overdone, then I kind of pivot a little bit. So I think it's been a cool journey over time. My channel has grown. It's been steadily growing. Um, but I've had awesome opportunities too, man, like to be able to create certain viral videos. Like I know we had the one-on-one -on -one video in West Virginia, which is my most popular video on my channel. We had moments where we collaborate with the NFL and host one-on-ones or whatever it may be in. I don't know. There's just different little key points and staples along my journey that have helped propel me to where I am today. And so, yeah, speaking of where you are today, you've gone from your friend's couch to 5 million YouTube uh, viewers, subscribers, um, and, you know, a, a small staff in five years or so. How about for the next five years? What are your aspirations? Man, that's a tough question. I'm not going to lie, because if you asked me five years ago when I was leaving school, if I would be here, I would probably would have said, nah, there's no way. But I'm just trying to put out good in the world and I feel like you're rewarded with good back. So doing good things, taking care of my friends, my family, the people around me, um, definitely diversifying a little bit because I know the clout doesn't last forever and I know the views ain't going to be up there forever. I mean, I hope, knock on wood, but, you know, just diversifying, getting into different real estate, getting into different business, getting into owning companies, things like that. So, you know, we'll, we'll see where it takes me. My end goal is just to be happy. So as long as I continue being happy, then wherever life takes, wherever life takes me, then I'll be good. All right. The channel is destroying, like destroying with an extra E. Donald De La Hay, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much, man. This was awesome. That's it for today. The PGA Championship starts today, setting up another clash between PGA Tour golfers and live golfers with a total prize purse of $15 million. Shoot us a question or message at today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.